A828840 Red Roth Financial versus Nona Tobin. Good morning, Mr. Scow. Good morning, Mr. Lancaster. Good morning, Miss Tobin. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. We are here on Ms. Tobin's motion for an evidentiary hearing to set aside orders and for sanctions pursuant to NRCP 60B3 and D3 NRS 18.0102 and EDCR 7.601 and 3 and Red Rock Financial Services opposition um, to Nona Tobin's motion for an evidentiary hearing to set aside the September 10th, 2021 order and November 30th, 2021 order and motion for attorney's fees and costs and counter motion for abuse of process or a vexatious litigant restrictive order against Nona Tobin and for attorney's fees and costs. Um, let me just make a couple of statements before we go into this and before I allow the parties to argue. Ms. Tobin, the only action that is in front of this court in Department 8 is the interpleader action. The court has previously decided that all of your counterclaims that you brought in this action were barred by the doctrine of claim preclusion. You keep asking this court to make a different decision without any basis in law to do so. I would note that originally um, that the court, when it first got this case and was dropped off with a multitude of notebooks, and this was set for my law in motion calendar, that the court looked at all of those notebooks and went, wow, I'm probably going to need an evidentiary hearing on this. And so that is the reason why the court originally thought, let's do an evidentiary hearing on this. Once I actually read the motion and reviewed the case files and looked at everything, I decided I didn't need an evidentiary hearing, which is the court's prerogative. It is not the litigant's prerogative to demand an evidentiary hearing. It is the court's prerogative to decide whether or not they want to have an evidentiary hearing. It is not the same as holding a trial. It is the court's ability to be able to say, I think that we need an evidentiary hearing on this because I need a record, a further record developed. In this particular case, the court didn't need a further record developed because it took a look at all of the filings and the pleadings and recognized that the counterclaims that you had filed, Ms. Tobin, were barred by claim preclusion. You continuously ask this court to make a different decision without any basis to do so. In looking at your new motion for reconsideration, um, you have in paragraph 21 that the court said, you know, that, that we, I failed to allow you to have your evidentiary hearing. Um, that without hearing your motion to distribute. I didn't need to hear your motion to distribute because that is the same basis as the interpleader action. That is the same basis as what has been filed by the plaintiff is they are trying to figure out where does this money go? So you're asking this court for it to rule on something that is in front of it that wasn't necessary for it to rule on. The number and in number 25 of your allegations, um, you say that uh, that I, the order was silent as to the other claims. No, I said all claims. All claims were to be dismissed. And as far as your other allegation that at the last hearing that I only gave you 15 minutes, um, actually, no, that's incorrect as well. I said that I only had 15 minutes and that, or we could continue the hearing. I then let you argue for almost 45 minutes after that. So 
the allegations that you're making don't change anything. Your remedy, if you don't like this court's decision, Ms. Tobin, is to file an action with the, with the Supreme Court and appeal my decision. It is not to continuously file motions for reconsideration and to lay out facts that are not involved in this case. This court cannot review things that happened in 2019 in another court in another court's case. The only thing that's in front of me is Red Rock Financial Services versus Nona Tobin, the counterclaims that you filed in this case and the basis that I dismissed them was claim preclusion. So having said all that, Ms. Tobin, it is your motion. This is why I wanted it to go last today, because I am going to give you as much time as you want to make your argument. So go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> I'm going to be a lot briefer than that, partially because um, I have a, a very bad cough and um, I might not be able to talk for very long. but. <clears throat> I believe that I have a simple way that could avoid appeal. But I just need to say that the court needs to understand I did not file this lawsuit. I am not the plaintiff in this case or in three of the four cases related to this dispute. I was a plaintiff once. My opponents originally won their lawsuit by cheating. They presented false evidence. They lied in their pleadings. They lied in their motions. They suppressed evidence. And the whole way that they prevailed in the first case was by my claims not being heard and no verified evidence being considered. All the verified evidence that was put into the court record is in my favor. And I'm sorry to burden this court with the volume of documents that I put in, but I had to put them in to get them into the record in this case in the event that I have to appeal. Because the, the claims preclusion does not apply <coughs> when there was no full and fair opportunity to litigate in the first instance, as in this case there was not. In the first case, um, the plaintiff was Jimmy Jack. Jimmy Jack had no admissible evidence of ownership. I challenged it under um, NRS um, 111345, but that claim was never heard. Jimmy Jack sued Bank of America that was a disinterested party and defaulted. And after they defaulted and that case was closed, Nation Star became the plaintiff in a second case against Opportunity Homes, also a disinterested party. Then Nation Star intervened on the closed Jimmy Jack case and succeeded in, um, uh, in prevailing both Jimmy Jack and Nation Star succeeded in prevailing without any evidence to support their, their ownership claims. Nation Star is provably not the owner of the um, disputed deed of trust, and yet they lied repeatedly to claim that they were and that they were owed a debt that they were not owed. Jimmy Jack and Nation Star made a side deal. They had a ex parte meeting with the judge 
they ended up without adjudicating any of their. Ms. Tobin, um, I'm yes. going to interrupt you right there. Please do not make unfounded, unprovable, and salacious allegations against another judge. About what? What was what? You what? made an allegation that a judge engaged in ex parte communications. There is no. It's totally proof of that. provable. There is no. Proof yes, of totally. It's Ms. on Tobin. the record. There is, it is no totally... proof of that, Miss Tobin. There is no proof of that. It is. There's salacious. no proof if you won't look at it. The proof is the minutes and the transcript of the April 23rd, 19 hearing where they discussed and decided the case in my absence. That doesn't make it get ex parte if you were informed of the hearing and didn't show up. I was not informed. I was informed if the hearing was continued to May 7th and they did it anyway. If it was on I the was record noticed. and you had an opportunity to be there, that is not the No, I did not time. have an opportunity to be there. I it I did not have an opportunity to be there. I was served notice on April 15th and April 22nd that the hearing was continued to May 7th. Okay. I was served notice not to appear. All right, and so that's the issue. Okay, continue. All right, so they proceeded based on this, um, their misrepresentation to the court that they could decide the title dispute among themselves and the court let them. The um, Jimmy Jack Nation Star settlement was complete fraud. They were neither neither of them parties to it. They um, it was between non-party Joel Stokes and Civic Financial Services, and it was used as a way to basically um, exclude me, a necessary party, from the deal. And then by convincing the court that I had never been a party, then they removed from me my rights. Um, to appeal. So, by any standards of professional and ethical conduct, they, those attorneys acquired that first ruling by means of fraud. And the um, motion for summary judgment that um, the HOA filed was based on Red Rock's falsified foreclosure for, file. And it is provable. And all that volume of documents that I submit will prove that. It totally will prove that. Now, all of my motions for reconsideration and all of my appeals have simply been to try and get a court any court to make a decision based on verified evidence instead of relying on the misrepresentation of opposing counsels. So if the court today decides, despite all evidence to the contrary, that I have no right to an evidence-based adjudication of my claims, then I will be forced to appeal to ask the Supreme Court to decide if this court's refusal to to consider the evidence was an abuse of discretion. However, I believe there's a straightforward way to resolve this today. And this court has the inherent authority to resolve this case and my petition for sanctions completely right now today. In this case, the high road and the path of least resistance is the same. I'm requesting this court to order each of my opponents to pay me restitution of the damages that I identified and have sustained in the amount of one and a quarter million 
and let them appeal it if they don't like it. My opponent's oppositions and counter motion for vexation litigant order were unsupported by any affidavits, and this court has the discretion to discount them in their entirety. <clears throat> None of my opponents has ever produced any verified evidence to refute my claims. They have merely staked their entire whole case on saying res judicata and that I have no right to make those claims. And given that no one has ever made any responsive pleading to deny my claims, and given that I have, and that they have never produced any evidence to contradict my verified evidence, that they lied to the court and falsified evidence to cover up criminal activity, you know, I, <clears throat> I asked the court, I asked the court to grant me this and end the case right now. And I estimate the chance that they will appeal approaches zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tobin. Mr. Scow. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I guess, I guess uh, Your Honor was presented with, with the scenario where either I don't know if this is chance seven or eight or nine, but if it's not granted, the request is granted, then there's going to be another appeal. And it's, it's troubling to me, Your Honor, that we're facing these issues over and over. And I, I appreciate the court's time. We know that you devote a lot of time and energy into these matters. And we very cautiously filed our counter motion, uh, to have Ms. Tobin declared a vexatious litigant. And I, I guess I just want to explain the basis of that or or narrow the scope somewhat because we are not saying, Your Honor, that Ms. Tobin wouldn't still have a claim to the excess proceeds from the foreclosure that happened um, last decade. <clears throat> so she would be allowed to pursue her claims there. Mm -hmm. However, she has brought the same claims against the same parties or similar parties seven or eight times and they're being denied every time i and i personally don't like being called a criminal she's insinuating that everybody uh, on the other side of things is is engaged in criminal conduct including the courts and it's just not appropriate your honor and really i guess the best evidence of or the best support for a finding of vexatious uh, litigant would be the reply briefs which were around 2,000 pages I believe that was the total um, pagination for the reply to the Red Rock motion and to the Nation Star joinder. Uh, that, that's almost proof in and of itself. But as the court well knows, there's been proper findings at each level of each of the prior cases dealing with Ms. Tobin. Um, she doesn't like the answer that she's been given, so she's repeatedly attacking um, those adjudications. But it's it's been based on the evidence every time. And, and Your Honor, I don't have anything else to add, but I'm open to any questions you, you may have for me. Thank you, Mr. Scow. Mr. Lancaster, do you have anything additional to add? Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Um, declaring somebody a vexatious litigant is a Herculean task. Um, I've actually looked into what needs to be done in order to do that. However, the court finds that the myriad of allegations that are being made by Ms. Tobin in this particular case have already previously been decided. There is no basis for this court to reconsider its prior decision that her claims in this case are precluded by claim preclusion. If she disagreed with any of the other courts as to what transpired, her role was to appeal those decisions, ask for motions for reconsideration, um, or take other actions in those other cases. It was not to file counterclaims into this case 
that are barred by the doctrine of claim preclusion and res judicata. Um, the court is going to deny Ms. Tobin's motion and is going to not grant the counter motion at this time, Mr. Scow, but here is what the court is going to do. The court is going to warn Ms. Tobin at this juncture that in the event that she continues to file seriatim motions with this court, that the court will have no other choice but to file an order to show cause to declare her a vexatious litigant um, and at that time would uh, entertain the opposition side for attorney's fees and costs. Um, Ms. Tobin, your statement to this court of you would have no other opportunity other than to file an appeal, that's your right. You can do whatever you feel that you need to do to protect your rights, but um, this court is not going to grant your motion. It is denied, um, and there is no reason for the court to hold an evidentiary hearing. This court's decision initially that Ms. Tobin's um, count counterclaims were precluded by claim preclusion and res judicata was a sound decision. Um, Mr. Scow, I know you've put a lot of effort into this case as well already. What I would like you to do is I would like you to prepare for this court, since I believe you've been involved since the very beginning, have you not? Yes, Your Honor, unfortunately. All right. What I would like you to do is I would like you to prepare an order that covers the procedural history in this case down to minutia. Um, and I want a very long, detailed order and of what transpired all along the way on this case and how it ended up in my courtroom and then the basis reiterated for my decision on the claims preclusion all the way up to what I said today regarding why this court didn't need an evidentiary hearing um, and the statements that I made today in regards to the counterclaims being precluded also include in that order that, and Ms. Tobin, as I said the last time that we were here, the complaint that was filed by Red Rock is an interpleader complaint, which is them essentially in legalese saying, we have this pile of money, who does it go to? And so you are absolutely free to be a participant in that case and to make the arguments that you made at least in part in this motion that you're the only one that is entitled to those funds. That's absolutely still in front of this court and that is appropriate for you to be involved in. So to the extent that that's what's in front of this court, that is what this court is going to deal with. Everything else um, is not before this court and um, is not appropriate for this court to review the decisions. This court is not a reviewing court. This court, it is not appropriate for this court to review the decisions that were made in any of the other departments of the 8th Judicial District Court and will not do so. And um, as it pertains to your counterclaims, as I said, and we'll say again, those claims are barred by claim preclusion and are res judicata. So that is the court's decision today. Um, Mr. Scow, I know that that's probably going to take you a little time to get that order together. Um, you want 30 days? 30 days should work, Your Honor, and I, I suppose we'll, uh, we're fine to circulate that to everybody that's present today. Yes, um, Whether or not we get agreement or not, we'll follow the standard procedure. What I'm going to have you do is 30 days 
circulate it to everybody, and then we're going to do um, put this in the order. If it's if if uh, any comments and or revisions are not received, ten days, ten business days after the order has been circulated, the court will sign the order. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Scow. Thank you, Ms. Tobin. Thank you, Mr. Fonin. Thank you, Mr. Lancaster. Have a good day. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Have a good day. All right.